Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to the Myron Wiener Seminar Series on International Migration, which is organized by the Inter-University Committee on International Migration, which brings together faculty from across the social sciences, mostly, but also some humanities um, in the Boston area, MIT, Boston University, uh, uh, Fletcher School of Dipl Law and Diplomacy class, Harvard, um, and Wellesley, among others. So uh, this seminar series has been going on since 2005, um, and it's really wonderful to still be engaged in this way with all of you. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Nuora Lori. I'm an assistant professor of international relations at Boston University. Um, I am so delighted to introduce my colleague from Boston University, Professor Susan Ekram, who's a clinical professor um, uh, at the Boston University School of Law and the director of the International Human Rights Clinic. She's also one of the foremost authorities on forced displacement in the Middle East and, and globally and looks at this is just one of many projects that she's going to be talking about today. And what I love about um, this project in particular is that I think so much of the research around forced displacement uh, focuses on the problems and just how daunting it is to think about this kind of global structure um, and pressures on forced displacement. And Professor Ekram is one of the people I turn to when I need some inspiration and hope um, for a way forward. And so um, today she's gonna to be talking about, I think a very concrete way um, that you can kind of respond to these um, questions of inclusion and forced displacement. So I won't um, take any more time. I'll just a few housekeeping and open it up to Q and A um, after Professor Ekram gives her talk. And for the audience on Zoom, thank you so much for, for joining us. And um, we will please, you can see the Q and A chat, um, please use that. On the chat, we'll also have um, uh, sending resource links, bios, upcoming events, and other information that might be of interest for you. But please do engage and send your questions. I'll be here to monitor them, whether they're in the room or on Zoom. So without further ado, Professor Wickham. Thank you so much, uh, Nura and Sabina, for inviting me and uh, also the Myron Wiener seminar. I've done a number of talks for this seminar before. It's always wonderful to have this university engagement. So I'm happy to share this presentation on the research and project of Murcia Strategy at the University of Murcia in Spain. And I have been conducting over the past year and a half, but, but have been thinking about for about a decade. Uh, we've been partnering with the National Non-Governmental Organization in Spain, Fundación Zapaim, which has been working to integrate asylum seekers and migrants for decades. And we're moving forward with a project we have called Refugees Resettled in Empty Spain. I'm going to start. Uh, on. Okay, um, I'll start with framing the problem, two aspects of the problem that we are uh, hoping to uh, find some solutions for, Empty Spain and the global refugee situation. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the Spanish uh, and EU factual, legal, and policy context in which we have framed a solution, and then uh, move to describing and unpacking the proposed solution, which is a legal pathway for community sponsorship in Spanish patrocinio comunitario. Um, so the Spanish population, uh, some of you already know this, is concentrated in cities around the coast with only eight cities in Spain with populations of over 400,000 people. The donut around the uh, internal area of the coast is rapidly losing or has lost population. Currently, Spain has only 14 people per square kilometer in 70% of its territory, and th thousands of towns and villages are dying out. In 2016, the writer Sergio del Molino published a book called La España Vatia, the empty Spain. But the name has been changed because people in the depopulated areas claim they're losing population due to deliberate government policies that concentrate resources in the big cities and that they've been abandoned by the national government. The reality is that uh, almost a third of the Spanish population is going to be concentrated in Madrid and Barcelona in about 15 years, unless there's a radical change in policies. 
Over a hundred of the depopulated areas have formed a political party called España Vaciada to reverse the trend led by the Soria Ya and Teruel Existe grassroots movements that have been working for some time to gain momentum around uh, political efforts. España Vaciada was registered as a political party in 2021. And in the first election in which they ran in Castilla, Castillo y León, its member party Soria Ya won 42.6% of the votes and obtained uh, leadership in three of the five provincial seats. Meanwhile, forcible displacement has caused over 100 million refugees and others to leave their homes. That's the count, it's actually 104 million as of today, with the majority of them hosted in the least developed or developing countries that are not able to meet their needs. Among the top refugee hosting countries, Lebanon is bearing the largest proportion of refugees to its population, with 1.5 million refugees from Syria for a country of 6.8 million people. That is 19.5% of its population, where about one in four people in Lebanon is a refugee. Nauru has the next highest, 5.9% of its population, due to Australia's offshoring uh, of its refugees to Nauru, while refusing to accept refugees on its national territory. Turkey has received more refugees than any other country since 2011, as many as, well, more than 5 million. Turkey signed an agreement with the EU in 2016 that requires it to prevent refugees from moving on to Europe. This week's earthquake in Turkey and Syria has hit major refugee and displaced populations from the Syrian conflict who have been in southern Turkey and northern Syria for uh, over 11 years. In the global north, meanwhile, Germany is the only country that has hosted over 1 million refugees in the last few decades. Turning to Spain, Spain as a member of the EU and the Council of Europe, and as a party to many human rights treaties, particularly the 1951 Refugee Convention of most relevance to our uh, framework here, has committed itself to both European and to international human rights standards to accept refugees and asylum seekers and to provide international protection to other vulnerable populations in its territory. Among the core obligations and commitments Spain has under these uh, treaties and agreements are to provide access to a fair and non-discriminatory refugee application process. The obligation of non refoulement which is the obligation not to send anyone to a country where they risk persecution, torture, or inhumane treatment, special protection for children and minors, and obligations to share in EU established quotas for accepting refugees or others fleeing conflict and to provide basic standards of treatment for them. Spain recommitted itself to core obligations under these agreements uh, towards both refugees and migrants by signing the UN Declaration on the Global Compacts on Refugees and Migrants in 2016. So despite countries in the global north, particularly Europe being parties to these international and European treaties that require them to provide basic protections and access to asylum to refugees and other forcibly displaced people, this framework of human rights is rapidly being eroded by informal agreements with countries at the periphery and in the center of Europe. The reality is that the majority of displaced people are forced to stay in protracted situations in countries least able to provide for them for reasons that include these externalizing agreements. And let me define just a few terms for clarity. Resettlement refers to the transfer of non-EU nationals or stateless persons who've been recognized as uh, refugees or persons in need of international protection to an EU member state. Relocation, on the other hand, is the transfer of those persons, either in need or beneficiaries of international protection, from one EU member state to another. Europe has instituted policies like the Dublin Regulation, which allows European states to require that refugees apply for asylum in the first European country in which they enter. 
But at the same time, other EU states are required to accept the transfer or relocation of a portion of those refugees under certain quotas uh, that have been accepted by the border states. But EU countries are also entering into the agreements as with Turkey and Libya uh, and the UK with Rwanda, UK is outside the EU now, but they require these countries to put measures in place to prevent refugees and migrants from trying to leave for Europe or to accept back refugees once they arrive in Europe. And the Dublin regulation explains why the migrant and refugee crisis is primarily concentrated in the border states of Italy and Greece and why countries in Europe's center choose how many they will agree to relocate. Similar to the EU-Turkey agreement, Spain's agreement with Morocco requires Morocco to police refugees and migrants, prevent them from crossing to Spain, and even with the small number of commitments towards resettling and relocating refugees, Spain has accepted just over a thousand, you'll see the numbers here on the screen, and actually integrated far fewer each year. And you see uh, Spain is far from meeting its quota requirements or its own commitments. A few more definitions. What is international protection? Uh, it is basically uh, a short or long-term solution to grant uh, safe haven, if you will, to asylees, refugees, and others in various forms of status. In Europe, those are lumped together called subsidiary protection uh, and beneficiaries of protection on humanitarian grounds. On the other hand, asylum seekers are people who claim refugee status once they have arrived in the territory of a state applying for asylum under domestic law rather than international law. Uh, claims for refugee status under the 1951 Refugee Convention are processed within Spain upon entry into Spanish territory. Um, and then there are a range of statuses, short-term statuses like temporary protected status on humanitarian grounds. Uh, Europe has mostly granted these to Venezuelan nationals, but really triggered uh, uh, EU-wide temporary protection program for the first time for the Ukrainians. It was never triggered for prior refugee situations. Um, so just to make the distinction between asylum seekers, we're talking about people who are applying for protection under domestic law and refugees who are applying for international recognition, but outside the territory where they might be able to find a durable solution. But Spain grants only 5% of asylum claims. It has thousands of applicants every year. And as you see, there's approximately 100,000 asylum case backlog currently in the Spanish system. Uh, Spanish asylum seekers can spend years in the process. And then at the end of a long process, they can suddenly find themselves in illegal status when they're denied under this high rate of denial, very few are going to be able to access permanent solutions. Once they are in illegal status, they're no longer able to work legally and they're forced to leave. This means that encouraging this category of seeker of displaced people or seekers of protection, uh, encouraging them to rural areas is not the best investment for these communities because the vast majority of them will lose status at the end of this period. All immigrants falling outside of these categories, refugees, asylum seekers, protection, humanitarian protection, are undocumented migrants and in a vulnerable situation as they are outside the legal protection system. Organizations like uh, Fundacion Zapaim have been working for many years to provide assistance and support to migrants and refugees in Spain, but they can do very little once their claims are denied and they're no longer eligible to work or receive benefits. For 15 years, Zapaim has run a program called Nuevos Senderos to encourage migrants to move to depopulated areas, but as I mentioned, they cannot re remain once they lose status. Spain has blamed Morocco. This is uh, um, the uh, Red Cross rescuing 
a migrant coming across from, um, from Morocco, entering Spain after a capsized boat. Spain has blamed Morocco for the so-called migrant crisis of 2018, when thousands of North Africans uh, entered uh, Ceuta and Melilla and uh, were crossing uh, onto Spain. Well, this is Spanish territory, but onto mainland Spain. Spain claimed a violation of the agreement it had with Morocco and uh, unfortunately opened fire uh, on many of the migrants. Uh, over a dozen people were killed and many people died trying to swim to uh, Spanish territory, mainland Spanish territory. Spain has forcibly pushed back refugees and migrants on this border, again, in violation of the European Convention and EU treaties, because it didn't allow individualized determinations of refugee status, and mass pushbacks and expulsions are manifestly illegal under international law because it automatically means that an individual has no op opportunity to apply for protection claim. The first national report on Spain's protection system was commissioned by the EU and published in 2018. The report was the first comprehensive analysis of Spain's international protection regime and covers all aspects of Spain's refugee, humanitarian protection and asylum processes. I cover these in the report on our pr proposal and I'm not going to address them here, but the overall assessment was that Spain has an outdated, and I quote from the report, and under-resourced system that lacks the tools with which to address today's international protection challenges. Among the critiques is that Spain has no overseas refugee resettlement program, despite a Spanish Supreme Court decision that it is required to do so to fulfill its treaty commitments. In conclusion, Spain needs a managed process for individualized refugee determinations so people don't have to lose their lives uh, in, their, in an attempt to reach safe haven in Spain, which brings us to our solution-oriented thinking. We focused on crafting a solution based on a model known as community sponsorship. Canada initiated the first community sponsorship program in 1979, following the Indochinese refugee crisis. Since then, it has run the world's largest community sponsorship program, which in recent years has actually outstripped the government-sponsored resettlement program. There is no real uniform understanding of community sponsorship uh, because it's rather an umbrella term, but all of the programs, community sponsorship programs, share the core aim of shared responsibility between civil society and the state for admission and integration of refugees. Conceptually, community sponsorship can be seen as both a form of resettlement or as a complementary pathway to the formal government-run programs. What are the main commonalities between and among the community sponsorship programs. First of all, a sharing of responsibility for financial and social support between government, civil society, and individuals for a defined period of time. And that period varies. The controlled arrival of refugees, whether as asylum seekers with humanitarian visas or as people who have been recognized as refugees with that status, with that legal status before they arrive. In principle, community sponsorship should be additional to state resettlement programs, but the different models don't always work that way. Government authorities retain ultimate responsibility for the actual designation and admission of sponsored refugees, but community sponsors are responsible for their acceptance and integration for provision of basic benefits and services and almost all of the community sponsorship programs have a minimum of one year of uh, community responsibility. With the assistance of the University of Murcia clinical students, we spent last year analyzing community sponsorship programs in seven countries to understand the different models and which might work or not work for Spain. I've just listed four here. Uh, to illustrate some of the difference for countries, some of the differences. 
The main differences between and among the various programs are number one, who can sponsor? Individuals, groups, combination of individuals, groups, and non governmental organizations. Who provides funding and for how long? What benefits must be afforded by whom and for how long? What kinds of legal agreements govern the sponsorship commitments and how legal responsibilities are shared among the different? actors, how the national and local obligations are administered in terms of legal status and benefits, and finally, what precise legal status is offered and where, for example, refugee status conferred abroad, short-term humanitarian status conferred abroad that can be renewed, or status only available upon arrival in the host country. Uh, this is kind of small, sorry about that, but you can see, I'll just point out some similarities and differences. We simply mapped out the key criteria and looked at them across countries. Um, what kind of agreement, who are the sponsors, how is the selection made, what kind of visa is offered, what is the exact legal status and can it change to a permanent status over time, duration of sponsorship and what kind of support uh, and our Sponsors are all the sponsor actors legally obligated through an agreement, or is there also volunteer involvement in the process? Italy's and France's programs are both driven by faith-based organizations, mostly Catholic uh, organizations, that are the main sponsors, though the legal status is provided the individuals admitted differ. The UK's programs, generally known as special vulnerable persons programs, pretty much outsource the government's obligations towards resettlement to private sponsors. That's not a model we are suggesting Spain should follow. Germany's program is very region specific, which has both advantages and disadvantages, but it's not ideal for the purpose of ensuring resettlement and integration taking place in abandoned areas, because the differences between what regions offer means refugees may feel discriminated against in certain areas and are more likely to move to regions offering more generous benefits. Also to be avoided in the Spanish model is uh, varied, uh, is great differences between the benefits that are offered in, from the different communities. So the key to success is uniform standards of treatment and more or less uniform financial and sponsor support. So some conclusions and lessons learned. Focus is really for us on expanding resettlement, not privatizing it. The protection of refugees and long-term integration is essential, not simply humanitarian assistance in the short term. So the benefits, benefits must be geared to long-term integration. The legal mechanisms must fit in existing overall national frameworks, but adapted to town and municipal needs and regulations. There has to be meaningful adaptation to the crisis of lack of durable solutions. Today, only 1% of the global refugee population has any access to resettlement. This model moves from a national decision-making to municipal and local decision-making model for resettlement, a bottom-up rather than the current top-down approach that is basically the global approach to resettlement. So what's happening? Uh, we are looking at three prior ad hoc community sponsorship trials. In 2019, this is also, sorry, it's small and it's in Spanish, but I'll tell you what's up here. Uh, <laughs> in 2019, the Basque country initiated a small community sponsorship program under Spain's national resettlement program called Alfolana II. The regional government took on the financial costs, but sponsors were coordinated through Caritas and the El Acuria Foundation, religious-based, faith-based organizations, to assist with housing and other support. Five Syrian families of 29 people were sponsored on referral from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. 
And there's been an evaluation of this program. We've learned some lessons from it. In 2020, Valencia launched a community pro sponsorship program based on the Basque Initiative, also led by church organizations to resettle 23 Syrian refugees. And in 2021, the government of Navarra with local authorities developed a com community sponsorship proposal, but this one is in process. So these have had varying success, very small, ad hoc, and we've also extracted some lessons. Tepaim now has, since November and the last meeting with the government, as the green light from the most relevant ministry, the Ministry of Inclusion and Immigration, to conduct a broader pilot project based on the elements of our proposed model in five communities. In Naval Moral de la Mata, these are the communities that are on the slide, Comarca del Campo de Calatrava, San Esteban de Gurmaz and Yanguas in the regions of Extremadura, Hubert's area, Castilla de la Mancha, Castilla La Mancha, Aragon, and Argentina. We'll be working together starting in June in these pilot communities, all of which are areas where uh, Thepaim has long developed partnerships for migrant employment and settlement. Uh, the chart here maps. Tepaim's breakdown of the main relevant aspects of each of these communities, their rural, urban, agricultural nature, the numbers, the population, and uh, the amount of time that Tepaim has been working with the communities. I've been to several of these, I'll tell you a lot about what's going on there, uh, but I'll save that for Q&A. Um, so our key recommendations is to revise Spanish protection law. And our ultimate hope is that we are going to draft a new <clears throat> law for community sponsorship that will allow uh, a new um, mechanism for overseas refugee identification and status granting outside of Spain. So people come to Spain already with permanent legal status as refugees. The proposal to the Spanish government is designed to draw on EU funding for development and refugee resettlement that focuses on very specific areas and to show how communities can directly sponsor refugees willing to come and resettle in underpopulated areas. Funding is now being applied for from the EU for the five pilot communities that uh, Tepaim has identified and our main recommendations on how it should run based from lessons from the other country modes are on the slide. Uh, let me just talk for a minute about available funding. There are two main sources of EU funds for this project. Uh, very recently, the EU has established a new funding stream. It's about three years old. Assistance specifically for depopulated areas around Europe. Spain is not the only European country that is experiencing depopulation. And the EU has long uh, provided 10,000 euros uh, per refugee available for any EU country uh, resettling refugees. We're also committed to the demand of refugee organizations around the world that are pushing back against what one of them told me was the flavor of the month approach. Yesterday, Syria, today, Ukraine. And insisting on what they are calling now a one refugee approach that is non-discriminatory in terms of national origin, race, religion, but focused on a match between community needs and the skills, background, and other human development resources refugees can bring to depopulated communities. I'm going to stop here and take any questions you might have. Question on Zoom. So maybe I'll start with the first one and give you all time. And please introduce yourself um, when you when you first ask your question. So our first question is from uh, Professor Anna Heidman, who is a, a fellow member of the Interuniversity Committee um, and, and couldn't be here in person today. But she asked a fascinating and thought-provoking presentation. I'm particularly interested in the comparison of community sponsorship programs and struck that it did not include Canada's program, which I may believe is the maybe the most longstanding. I think you mentioned it before, actually. Um, 
And I'm wondering whether there are formal and in particular scholarly, not just colloquial evaluations of the various community sponsorship programs. Have they been evaluated? What results and comparisons um, with alternatives? Yes, so uh, definitely I didn't really want to talk about Canada's program because uh, what I wanted to show was uh, the new models in Europe, because uh, obviously those would be closer to what we would be looking for in terms of the European and EU legal framework. So it's much more relevant to our work. But of course, we, we definitely uh, did a lot of research on Canada's program. Uh, uh, the answer is yes. Now there is quite a bit of uh, comparative research that's been done on community sponsorship. UNHCR is paying a lot of attention to community sponsorship programs uh, as part of a move to looking for alternative complementary pathways because resettlement is basically dysfunctional. Uh, and in these protracted refugee situations, it's clearer and clearer that refugees can't go home. The average uh, refugee population now is in a host country for a minimum of 10 years. And there are many refugee populations that are now intergenerational mm -hmm. populations. So uh, uh, there's a lot of material. I'm very happy. Anna, I can send you some links uh, and very happy to share uh, the research that we have done as well. Thank you. We have more of the questions on Zoom, but I just want to see if anyone in the room would like to pose a question. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, I'm Timothy Lowe. I'm a PhD student in anthropology here at MIT. Um, I used to work in refugee assistance, and I know people who actually benefited from Canada's program and are now settled in Canada and the UK. I, I, I might have missed this, but I'm just wondering whether this program is here in the US or in, whether the US has anything kind of similar um, like a community sponsorship program. Yes. So the Biden administration has just announced uh, a sponsorship program. Um, the problem with implementing the kind of community sponsorship that we're talking about in Spain is that U.S. overseas refugee uh, decision-making and asylum decisions are uh, the most tightly regulated national decision-making of almost any area. Mm -hmm. And so supplanting, there is not a possibility under U.S. law and definitely not political appetite. Yeah for enlarging refugee resettlement or asylum numbers by communities taking the decisions themselves. Spain is such a wonderful country for this because uh, the Spanish communities are relatively, they call it, they're autonomous and they can make a lot of their decisions themselves. So there are, there's an opportunity for bottom up that doesn't exist here. And what the U.S. means by this new sponsorship program is basically uh, that organizations, it's not individuals, it's going to be organizations, though individuals will play a part, that organizations will take more of the financial burden on the integration piece. It's not going to change anything in terms of the way overseas refugee processing works or the way asylum decision making in the country works. Unfortunately, we're a long way away. Uh, we'd love to see that happen but probably not in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, Professor Greenhill. Kelly Greenhill, uh, Thompson, MIT. Uh, uh, thank you for a fascinating and as uh, Laura uh, uh, noted, um, uplifting presentation. I, what I have to say is maybe more of a comment than a question, but I'm interested in your feedback. Uh, when Norway tried to do something like this to repopulate their less populated areas in the North, Something that was not anticipated and unintended was that a lot of these folks ended up moving south to Oslo. Mm -hmm. So um, it was on the plus side allowed for resettlement and was good for the refugees, but ultimately didn't end up um, benefiting the Norwegian government as intended. Now, I don't know if this was a community mm -hmm. sponsorship program or a government sponsor program, but um, there's a quite a question embedded here or maybe a suggestion for very valid reasons. You brought up equal uh, benefits across communities, mm -hmm. but maybe this, the Norwegian experience might um, 
give some food for thought for uneven mm -hmm. benefits in order to encourage people to stay in places where they might otherwise decide to migrate internally once um, they've been resettled. Mm -hmm. anyway, I welcome your thoughts and thank you again. Yeah, so uh, two responses to that, uh, because I get this question a lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and the first is that we are so lucky to have Epaim because it has these these years of experience already with uh, integrating migrants into these depopulated areas. So they have figured out what incentives work. Um, and uh, when I visited like Yanguas and uh, San Esteban de Gourmaz, which are two of the communities, pilot communities, they have loads of ideas, wonderful ideas, including there is housing going begging. And people have, uh, mayor of Yanguas he and his wife were living in Madrid and couldn't afford a place to live for their children. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to move to Yanguas. They have a beautiful house, old stone house that they've rebuilt with land around that they could not ever have dreamed of. And mm -hmm. they are so happy with their move. But they're, these are the kinds of incentives that the communities have another uh, really interesting example, also Yanguas. Um, there's a lot of agricultural land around uh, Yanguas and they were offering it for a song to anybody who wanted to come either develop it or, or grow crops or do whatever. And there was a Romanian family who was living also living in Madrid and his dream was to have a cattle farm they moved to Yanguas and he's got his cattle farm and they also have a beautiful stone house. <laughs> so there's a lot of thinking amongst the communities themselves. They have plenty of ideas of how to do this. And now, of course, there's been this new remote uh, working possibility. So connecting remote areas to cities is easier than ever. Um, and in certain areas, there has been a slight reverse movement from people in the cities going out and finding places in the uh, rural areas during COVID. Um, so yeah, lots lots of ideas on the table. Well, I see lots of hands in the room. Um, there's uh, three questions on Zoom. I'm just gonna take two of them and group them and then come to, to the participants in the room. Um, so Adriana Ramirez asked, what does the public in these small rural communities think about receiving refugees and the resettled people from such diverse backgrounds? I lived in Germany during the so-called European refugee crisis and people in smaller towns were always welcoming. And this led to the strengthening of the far right. I think it's connected to uh, Elena's question um, who asks, for community-based sponsorship models, community support and trust is crucial. Is there evidence of support from Spanish communities to sponsor refugees, regardless of race, religion, et cetera? Uh, well, I can't say for all the communities, but certainly the ones that we have identified for now, because they're Tepaim's communities that Tepaim knows well, uh, and where migrants have been working and living as long as they can, uh, and the migrants, the majority of migrants are North Africa. So from what, I mean, my conversations with people, again, this is not, this is only representative and only the few communities that I've actually talked to. I didn't hear a thing about race. It's interesting that this question comes up here in the US, mm -hmm. but TENS did not come up in Spain with all the actors that we spoke to. And uh, in a place like Yanguas with 68 people, and their mayor, uh, they were saying they loved having the Romanian family. There was a Moroccan family that they were able to uh, get also to move from one of the cities, I can't remember where. They were going to close their school because you need four children in this, to keep a school open. And the Moroccan family had three kids. There was already one kid in the young West. They kept the school open. Mm -hmm. So for them, that was a huge, huge thing because then, of course, that meant money coming to the community um, and teachers and on and on. So I did not hear from anyone during the year that I was there talking to people and working on this project uh, that they cared about where people came from. They were making the right contributions and they, you know, they were going to sponsor them you were going to sponsor them. And loads of ideas. I mean, really interesting ideas. I can talk about that for a long time. <laughs> okay, I'll take a couple of questions from the room. Well, I just piggyback on, on this theme about the uh, repopulation of 
vacated towns. Um, there is a reason for the towns being vacated. Yeah. I mean, there's an economic reason. Yeah. So I would recommend that you lawyers team up with urbanists and urban planners and so on to actually figure out how to make these economically viable. I mean, one, I've read in the newspapers about you know individual families making it, but it actually requires an entire economic revitalization of these places. Yes. And that's why the second fund that's funding stream that I was talking about is so important because mm -hmm. this second recent EU funding stream is specifically to develop economic opportunities and to give all kinds of incentives to rural areas, money and business incentives to draw business and entrepreneurs into remote areas. So this is a big development and probably we wouldn't have even gotten to first base with this proposal with our Spanish partners if they didn't right. see this funding as a huge uh, piece of this puzzle. So I have two in the room and then people on Zoom, I see your questions will come right back to you. I'm actually an urbanist. Thank you. <laughs> I'm an alumni of course 11. Department of Urban Studies and Planning. So I've done planning with uh, the UN and um, US government. Anyway, so um, I had worked in Afghanistan um, and the last, was it almost two years, no, almost two years ago, you saw what happened with Afghanistan. So I'm a co-founder of Afghan Hope Foundation, trying to deal with the refugees coming in, mm -hmm. Afghan refugees coming into the US. Mm -hmm. And it was hard. Uh, mm -hmm. We tried to do the community sponsor of Welcome to USA. Couldn't get through it because it needed to be a 501 already. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have it now. Mm -hmm. But what we found the challenge was um, the language and the training because they could be doctors there. They can't be doctors mm -hmm. here and so forth. Um, and I wanted to tie it to Spain mm -hmm. because I wanted to know what was going on in Valencia, as you know, because of Alicante. Mm -hmm. um, how did they deal with language training and did they map out the skill sets of the different, different refugees to maybe help them plug in to what is needed there? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Valencia, uh, project is the newest, and we actually don't have information on it yet. Uh, but this is what Sepaim does. This is what it's been doing for 20 years, uh, figuring out the skill set of, of each individual migrant asylum seeker, finding the locations where they can best uh, do the work that they do, finding uh, housing. They, this is their work integration. And so they have, this is why we feel so fortunate to be partnering with them. Um, but having said that, it's very clear that uh, each community is going to need a kind of expert group of people, right? urban planners, architects, construction people, loads of folks who are going to need to lend their expertise. But I was so impressed with San Esteban de Gourmaz, which has long been uh, trying to uh, create itself as a hub for language training in the region. This is Castilla Leon, uh, and as vocational training. So they have a lot of North African migrant workers. They've set up this huge training center. It's actually a compound. Uh, they've done it so brilliantly because there's a school, a vocational language training and elderly housing and all in the same area. And the kids after school, there's a program where the people living in the elderly housing do after school teaching for the migrant kids. And we met with some of these people and they said that, they said, we learn more from these kids than they learn from us. It was really beautiful, but they thought this through. And so, um, I mean, we talked to, migrants from Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, and they were all learning Spanish and all working in the compound one way or another. So they've, you know, they've thought about really uh, innovative ways to be able to both combine the employment needs, the housing needs, and language needs. That's fantastic. It is fantastic. I mean, if we could only have it here where there's a center where we can, you know, that was the challenges with the Afghans. 
um, you know, Dari and Pashto is so different from English. Mm -hmm. And then the culture is just different. I had found there was a lot of English language areas, but then some are like, well, we don't want to walk. We don't want to, you know, it's just a lot of kind of barriers. That but the communities, if they want to do this, they figure it out themselves because they have the incentive to do it. And especially if there's, you know, funding coming for mm -hmm. the development to make it work. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. I think I'm just going to build on the urbanist thread as I'm a PhD candidate in course 11 in urban planning. Oh, <laughs> During my, my time at MIT, also thanks to the support of Misty Italy, I had the opportunity to investigate some similar mm -hmm. challenges in Italy. And mm -hmm. right now with colleagues from Politecnico di Milano, we're looking at telecommunication data to understand whether small towns can be somehow prone to a new type of geography of labor mm -hmm. and remote working. In, in Italy. So it's like very similar conversations we're having on an Italian context. So thanks for also bringing the refugee lands in because it's something that definitely in the urban planning department and as a person who comes from architecture, I'm not super familiar with, but it's a crucial element of the discussion we're having right now on shrinkage, repopulation, and also integration with different like communities mm -hmm. in shrinking areas. And I have two quick questions for you. One is about the overall like policy framework. You mentioned at some point that you're trying to like switch from a sort of like nationally arranged resettlement program to sort of a more town-based bottom-up. And I also kind of wonder how this is gonna get operational on the ground. Is, this, is it gonna be based on towns putting out, let's say calls or like for how many people they can receive, how this is gonna be managed locally, given the, the broader, let's say national, differences between Britain and Spain. And on a sort of, let's say, built environment perspective, as a person who comes from an architecture background, I was wondering whether you've come, uh, you've got to know anything about current policies that come, that bring together the heritage component of some of the small towns mm -hmm. with the needs of new communities. Mm -hmm. Something I've witnessed in remote towns in Sicily, for example, that they're lacking spaces of worship. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to find places for gatherings of communities that might not share the same religious belief or some of the communities that are already in there. And some of these topics come into like, can create tensions locally. And so there is a role, I, I, I think, on the regional and national scale on how to provide some of these spaces and opportunities that are sort of lacking on, on the ground. Yes, two really good questions. So uh, operationally, as I mentioned, there is a Supreme Court decision in Spain that says that Spain is required to do, uh, to implement a formal refugee resettlement program, which it does not have. Spain's entire uh, resettlement is through ad hoc humanitarian admissions. It doesn't have a formal overseas refugee process. Um, there, is, there are uh, possibilities for Spanish consulates abroad to grant asylum in exceptional cases. And this Supreme Court decision said, Spain is required both under EU European convention law and the refugee convention to have an overseas refugee processing. So our proposal is going to be that the processing happens through uh, Spanish consulates, but that it will be in cooperation with NGOs like FEPAIM who will provide profiles submitted to them by the communities to the con that will go directly to the consulates. So they'll work hand in hand with the consulates. And uh, then the consulates will take refugee referrals, not just from UNHCR, but any of the international NGOs that are working in the host countries with the refugees and match them and then process the, uh, the entry. So, uh, and I worked, I was the uh, director of the uh, US resettlement program after the first Gulf War in Saudi Arabia and got very familiar with how different countries do their resettlement. Uh, so, and those that don't <laughs> do it well, um, but was really impressed with the Swedish, Swedish uh, processing because they did something like this. They determined in advance where the refugees that they uh, that they recognized were going to go and told the communities who was coming. And so the communities knew 
I mean, this is going to be a little bit different because it's going to be the communities asking, but it's much the same kind of process. So that's that's the plan for how, how it would work. Um, and on the second question, yeah, I think that is a difficult, we've, we've thought about that and talked about that. And as I mentioned, when we talked to those, uh, the women in San Esteban, one of their complaints was that they want to have a mosque. They didn't yet have permission for a mosque. So those are going to have to be worked out. I think that those issues, again, with org national organizations like Thepaim that are working on inter-community relationships to make sure that integration works, they'll have to deal with that. And that's just going to be on a community by community basis. But, but there are going to be many questions like that. <laughs> Thank you. I have two on Zoom and Alyssa has been waiting patiently. But since we have six minutes, just for time management, I want to see if there's a show, if anyone waiting to ask a question or no. Okay, then um, Alyssa Greenberg asks, I know Spain is starting a digital nomad visa program this year and soon. Um, do you see that program interact, interacting with or disrupting refugee resettlement as described here, especially since the program has been discussed as one of you know solution to to this uh, to emptied areas, and then I'm also going to share a comment um, mm -hmm. from an anonymous attendee who says, "I know from walking the Camino Sant Santiago 500 mile pilgrim walk across northern Spain, I notice, of course, the many abandoned villages throughout many of the provinces. It is such a great place uh, for getting in the Camino, bars and hostels and welcome areas." Um, thousands of walkers need these services. There are many routes to San Santiago mm -hmm. and more and more routes bring more international visitors. It seems having migrants owning and running small businesses could be interesting. Yeah, yeah, great idea. I hadn't thought of that. Though I've done part of the Camino myself. Wore out my feet. Um, so uh, again, the, the question. The, uh, the, uh, about the digital nomad. Ah, yes, yes, yes. So again, uh, visas are not permanent resettlement. It, and so someone coming in with a visa doesn't have a pathway, I don't think has a pathway or will have a pathway under Spanish law to permanent mm -hmm. status. So uh, visa programs like that would not be competing in the least yeah. with our proposal. Um, anyone in the room have a question? We have um, a follow-up from Alyssa, or, or um, kind of a different question, but um, what you're describing thus far is painstakingly and, and intensely human-based, um, careful matching of communities with individual people or families. Of course, any successful resettlement is better than none, but do you have a vision of how this kind of program might be scaled up? Well, we know we have to start slow. Mm. Uh, and that the pilot that we've got the green light for the pilot communities the spanish government has given us in theory their its approval um elections can change everything right yeah. this is a socialist yeah. government in spain and we're all so lucky about that. <laughs> um but we have to start small and we have to have success uh and at the same time that's not going to stop writing the draft law that we hope to submit at the end of this initial process. Um, but it's going to be a long game. Thank you. Um, since we have three more minutes, I'll ask my question, which I've been um, holding back on. So um, I'm just curious about comparisons. I mean, we have other ways of thinking about sponsorship programs that predate the Canadian example for labor migration, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's mm -hmm. a very typical way of I mean, the entire kafala system and, um, and other uh, Gastabaita in Germany, Bracero. Um, some of these programs are kind of critiqued for creating uh, unequal balance of mm -hmm. power between sponsors and sponsees. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, whether that comes up in some of this community sponsorship or the fact that their communities, not private companies, um, mm -hmm. uh, makes a difference here. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, in the critiques of, I'm thinking particularly of the German case where uh, part of the critique was from the refugees themselves who said that they thought people in other areas were getting more funding than them, that they weren't consulted 
with a lot of decision making, that there was a lot of ambiguity. So we very much have in mind these kinds of pitfalls mm -hmm. uh, and what is going to uh, address those is going to be very careful multi-party agreements. So the national NGO is going to have a lot of responsibility for monitoring the uh, and why national NGOs are so important because then they can do the comparison between what the different communities across the country are receiving. Uh, and we're very committed to NGOs that are not faith-based yeah. because one of our other critiques of the models in Europe is that they have been driven by the Catholic Church and it's been mostly Christians who've benefited mm -hmm. and we are also opposed to that kind of model. Yeah. So there are a lot of factors that will go in, but they will have to be regulated through these multi-party agreements. Those are going to be key. Well, wonderful. At 12.59, I think that must be a miracle. <laughs> time at an academic talk. Can we screw that up for a bit? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're, uh, both of you want to, please go ahead. Go ahead, no, please. All right, and there was a recent article in El Pais, I think it was, of um, two West African immigrants to Spain, who two years ago had intervened in a mob beating up on a transgender person. Mm -hmm. And they intervened and were successful in protecting this person and were hailed as heroes. Mm -hmm. And they were offered a very nice job by a wonderful employer, etc., who thought they were terrific. And they were um, taken up to, I think it was Galicia. Oh, wow. Anyway, two years later, they are now suing that employer for exploitation. Oh, wow. So there has to be some follow up. Oh, on, yes. You know, yes. who is paying what for mm -hmm. what sort of mm -hmm. job? Well, and I, and I have to say, this is something we've talked about with Sepaim because they do monitor labor conditions. Right. They are very careful about following up with the migrants that they move to these areas. Yeah. They check in on their, they have a whole rural areas operation. Mm -hmm. And their staff are so impressive. They are following their migrants. They check that the employers are obeying the law. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing for them because they're getting funding from the federal government. Right. And so they have to ensure that the laws and rent policies are being followed. So of course we would want the same thing. We'll ensure the same thing <laughs> continues. Kelly, do you wanna? Um, it's not that important. I was just I was intrigued by your you, nor your um, selection of examples because those are were all designed to be temporary, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Are, they ended up being more permanent. But apropos of the visas are not the same as resettlement. Yeah, um, it just caused my head to spin a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are, should we be thinking about these things the same way because these temporary programs all, often beget more permanent settlement or are the sets of problems distinct in ways that we ought to unpack a bit, which is not a question to raise at uh, you know a couple of minutes after. <laughs> to me, just, just leave it as for thought. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Please join me in, in uh, thanking. Our next event will be on March first, um, and we will have David David Kadulis, um who will be speaking about enhancing the positive impact of human um, mobility in developing countries. So I hope. Thank you to everyone on Zoom.